And to introduce our final featured speaker of the morning, I'd like to invite the director of the National Churchill Museum of the United States, Mr. Tim Riley. Thank you, David, and thank you, everyone. I am actually the understudy to introduce uh, Lord Watson. Uh, my colleague uh, and good friend, Philip Beckman, uh, is a partner uh, with a law firm based in London, but uh, he is now working uh, on the art of an, his own deal here in New York at the New York office, so he could not be with us. So um, I am pleased to fill in for Philip. And you know, I'm reminded of the famous postscript on the letter that was sent to Winston Churchill inviting him to Westminster College for the Iron Curtain speech, uh, where Harry Truman uh, wrote, this is a wonderful school in my home state. If you come, I will introduce you. To paraphrase, uh, this is a wonderful conference in my former home state. You have come. I'm pleased to introduce you. And introductions are important. Uh, we had Lord Watson visit Fulton uh, this week last year. And he was very kind to speak to a group of elementary school students in the great historic Christopher Wren Church of St. Mary the Virgin Alderman Berry. We did not introduce him. That was a mistake. The students had just completed a worksheet in the galleries of the museum. One of the first questions was, what year was Winston Churchill born? They all got the answer correct. Uh, and when Lord Watson came to the stage to field questions from this elementary school class, one little boy looked up at him, puzzled, scratching his head, doing math in his head, I could tell, and said, if you were born in 1874, <laughs> how come you haven't croaked yet? Well, I, I learned that we should have introduced Lord Watson uh, as uh, an eminent scholar, businessman, uh, speaker, uh, and historian, uh, not as Winston Churchill. Uh, an award-winning BBC broadcaster for over 20 years presenting Panorama, the money program, Lord Watson is a partner of the CTN Group. Based at their TV studio complex in St. Martin's Lane, London, CTN is acknowledged as a preeminent multimedia consultancy and production company. He is a fellow of the Royal Television Society and former chairman. Lord Watson holds a range of visiting and honorary posts and, a, and doctorates at universities in Britain and abroad, including the recent award of an honorary doctorate by Birmingham University. He was elected as high steward of Cambridge University for life in 2010. He is an honorary fellow of Jesus College, a patron of the Churchill Archives at Churchill College, and the chairman of the Cambridge Foundation. He was recently, in June of this year, made a Churchill Fellow at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. A former president of the Liberal Party, Lord Watson played a leading role in the merger between the British Liberal Party and Social Democrats. He was appointed CBE in 1985 and raised to the peerage in 1999. He has been awarded the Churchill Medal, holds the Knight's Grand Cross of Germany's Order of Merit, the Commander's Grand Cross of Romania's Order of Merit, and a host of other honorary posts. An author, his books include Europe at Risk, The Germans, Who Are They Now?, Jamestown, The Voyage of the English, The Queen and the USA, and most recently, Churchill's Legacy, Two Speeches, to Save the World, published by Bloomsbury Worldwide last year. I'm pleased to introduce to you the Right Honorable Lord Alan Watson of Richmond, who will speak to us about Churchill and Germany. Lord Watson. Thank you very much. I'm going actually to Fulton at the end of this week. I'm hoping I meet that young man again, <laughs> just to prove that I haven't croaked yet. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be sitting there with a stopwatch or something. 
Um, well, first of all, just one remark about, if I can get my glasses out, that is, yes, here we are, um, the efficacy of a conference like this. If you ever had any doubt about it, and you saw the Daily Telegraph on Monday, you would understand why a conference of this kind and this relevance is urgent and necessary. The Telegraph published the findings of a survey of 2,000 adults in the UK earlier this year, and it was undertaken for the History Channel. The findings are startling. 53% claimed to be knowledgeable or even very knowledgeable about World War II. But one in 20 thought we were on the same side as Germany. <laughs> one in 10 had no idea that Adolf Hitler was involved. One in 20 thought that Germany and the United Kingdom were on the same side. And 43% did not know that the Battle of Britain was fought in the skies above Britain, and three in 10 had never heard of the Blitz. One finding which is perhaps marginally more understandable, one third totally were confused as to whether France or the United States had been allies of the United Kingdom in the Second World War. Now, why is that sort of finding really quite serious? It's serious because the legacy of Churchill, the meaning of Churchill, the relevance of Churchill grows, does not diminish. But if we lose the memory of Churchill, if we allow that to slip from our grasp, the penalties will be very great. The great Martin Gilbert, you know, introducing Winston's history of the First World War, uh, the world crisis. As you remember, Nancy Astor said of him, Winston's written an enormous book about himself and called it The World Crisis. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Churchill wrote in it, how strange it is that the past is so little understood and so quickly forgotten, and he lamented, we live in the most thoughtless of ages. If you think of the figures I gave of the Daily Telegraph report, we today seem to be living in the most ignorant of ages. The quality of leadership, the quality of media, the quality of public opinion indeed demonstrates this. Our ignorance of the past can make us reckless with the present and deeply irresponsible about the future. So let's try and get it right. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, I want briefly uh, to talk about Churchill and the Germans. And indeed, I am planning my next book to be on that subject. And I want to focus on it not because I believe that we are heading for a further confrontation with the Teutonic world, uh, but because I believe we do not understand sufficiently sharply and well how our present relationship with Germany has been enabled in prophetic terms by Winston Churchill himself. Randolph Churchill, who is there, yes, told me an extraordinary story earlier on this year, which is surprising. But why is it surprising? As a matter of fact, it shouldn't be surprising. And the story is simply this, that in 1932, Winston Churchill was on a cruise in the Aegean with Clemmy, and they arrived off the Acropolis. And Winston disembarked himself with all his painting equipment and other accoutrements, such as brandy, cigars, and so on, and they all clambered up to the top of the Acropolis. And when he was there, what did Winston do? He got out his oils and he painted the Acropolis. And he did so, as with most of his paintings, with strong primary colors. So the Acropolis was displayed as gleaming white broken marble columns, 
framed by the deep blue of an Aegean sky and sea. Now, Randolph told me, and we have checked this out, that something very strange happened in the post-war relationship of Winston Churchill and democratic Germany. Winston had spotted that Konrad Adenauer was not only the most likely leader of democratic Germany after the war, but that, in his words, he had the potential to be the greatest statesman of Germany since Bismarck. Well, be that as it may, Winston Churchill gave Konrad Adenauer that painting of the Acropolis, and he passed it to Adenauer with this thought. I give you this painting to encourage you because it demonstrates that democracy can grow from ruins. And Conrad Adenauer kept that painting on the wall in his chancellor's office for all the years in which he was chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany. Now, the strategic scale and the evolution of Winston's relationship with Germany um, can be aptly summarized, and I think is most poignantly summarized actually by the four morals, as he called them, which Churchill used in his history of World War II. In war, resolution. In defeat, defiance. In victory, magnanimity. And in peace, good will. Before amplifying those, I think to give some background, it's important to realize that Churchill's familiarity with Germany went way back to 1905, the time of his first visit. And interestingly enough, uh, he visited Germany to witness military maneuvers. He was invited personally by the Kaiser in Silesia. And perhaps typically, uh, he went actually on the first anniversary of his wedding to Clemmy. <laughs> and he was uh, in Strasbourg, and he wrote improbably on a postcard to Clemmy, the bells of this great cathedral remind me of nothing so much as the bells of St. Margaret's a year ago when we got married. Well, if you've ever heard the bells of those two <laughs> churches, you will know they bear no similarity at all. But uh, I'm sure Clemmy was very pleased to receive that missive. But uh, he was there because he was going to these maneuvers. And uh, he said of the Kaiser, quite a jolly fellow, always gives me boxes of unopened cigars. But he had a nervousness about the Kaiser, which he captured in comments. And even then, that early, a nervousness about the way Germany was going. He said of Germany in 1905, this is a country divided between socialists and imperialists, and it is not clear who's on top. And he was also anxious that the Kaiser, who he read correctly as a febrile man, nervous, desperate to prove himself, and as you know, somewhat a cripple, that this man would not be able to resist the temptation of using the best army in Europe. And he was right in that view. But let's now go back to in war resolution, in defeat, defiance, in victory, magnanimity, and in peace, goodwill. Well, first of all, resolution. Resolution. In two world wars, he contributed decisively to the frustration and the ultimate defeat of German power and their attempt to capture world and European dominance. And he knew, by the way, what he was up against. And let me just read from this famous world crisis how he actually saw Germany when he wrote it. In the sphere of force, human records contain no manifestation like the eruption of the German volcano. 
For four years, he's talking about World War I, Germany fought and defied the five continents of the world by land and sea and air. The German armies held her tottering Confederates, intervened in every theater with success, stood twice the bloodshed, sorry, stood everywhere on conquered territory and inflicted on their enemies more than twice the bloodshed they themselves suffered. To break their strength and science and fury, it is necessary and it was necessary to bring all the greatest nations of mankind into the field to fight against them. So he didn't underestimate what he was up against in World War I, and as we saw again in the film yesterday, he certainly did not underestimate what he was up against in World War II. <coughs> Yesterday's film was essentially, I suppose, about resolution. It was about courage. It was also, of course, about defiance. Defiance not only of the fury of the Nazi onslaught, but of British political blindness. Let's turn to the second, magnanimity. I wrote two years ago a book called Churchill's Legacy, Two Speeches to Save the World. And those speeches were Zurich, the famous Europe Arise speech, and six months previous to that in Fulton, the Missouri, the Iron Curtain speech. Now, if we look at those two speeches and what they achieved, in one sense, modern Germany, democratic Germany, was the chief beneficiary. Because the first speech, uh, that in Fulton, resulted in the security structure of the West, and without that security structure, Western Germany could not have survived. And the second speech really created the architecture of the Marshall Plan and the economic recovery of Western Europe, and as its precondition, the reconciliation between France and Germany. So the degree to which modern Germany, now, thank goodness, a whole country which is democratic, that is something which in a way was shaped almost crafted by the imagination and the foresight of Winston Churchill. When he gave that picture to Conrad Adenauer, it was not an example of wishful thinking. At our last conference, I remember you spoke about the lachrymose nature sometimes of Winston Churchill. Well, he may have been wet-eyed from time to time, but he was always clear-eyed. There was nothing sentimental or sloppy about Churchill's view of Europe and what Europe would need. The debt that we owe Churchill and the debt which the Germans owe Churchill is profound. And one of the reasons that I want to write about Churchill and Germany and Churchill and the Germans is I feel very committed to having a greater and wider view in modern Germany, particularly the part of Germany which used to be the DDR, of what they really owe. So just a couple of things about that relationship and what actually happened. <clears throat> In the fourth volume of The World Crisis, The Aftermath, Churchill records a dinner conversation which took place in Downing Street on Armistice Day, the 11th of November, 1918. And he dined alone with Lloyd George. And outside, there was vast jubilation in the center of London, of course, and in Downing Street itself. But the two men dined alone. Their main subject of conversation was Germany, because both men understood that there could be no sustainable peace in Europe unless the German issue was grasped and a move was made to a democratic Germany. Incidentally, at that time, there was famine in Germany, and Churchill argued and persuaded Lloyd George to send convoys of actually a dozen ships fully loaded with food to Hamburg to relieve the German 
famine. <clears throat> if you go through this history, as I say, of these in war defiance, in defeat, and so on, I've talked about in victory magnanimity. And I still think, when you look back on it, it is extraordinary. There was within Churchill a dimension which does not balance, but it is only possible because in war defiance, nobody ever was more committed to the defeat of Germany in both world wars because he knew so well what was at stake. But having achieved victory, the hatred of the enemy is replaced actually amazingly quickly by, in peace, goodwill. And he was deeply serious about, in peace, goodwill. So if we look at our relationship now with Germany, I was very struck, I think it's two years ago now, uh, when Angela Merkel came to London and addressed the British Parliament in the Royal Gallery in the Palace of Westminster. And she said, as part of her speech, no one need ever question the European credentials of Great Britain because Britain proved its European credentials in 1940. It proved its European credentials in 1940. It was an extraordinary remark for a German, a West German Chancellor to make. And it surprised the German media quite as much as it astonished our own. <clears throat> In war, defeat, resolution, victory, and peace, never naive or sentimental about it at all, his realism has helped to bring into being the democratic Germany with which today we are such a strong and important ally. Churchill's role in the reconstruction of that relationship <clears throat> from the brilliant shaft of insight which lies behind his gift of that painting to Conrad Adenauer, to the steady understanding and advocacy of the structures which have brought peace and security to Western Europe, particularly in the years of its long confrontation with the Soviet Union. This is an enormous debt. And I am quite determined that if I can get this book done, I hope that it will have an effect, not only here and in Britain, but also in Germany itself. Because our relationship has been reshaped in no small part by the prophetic understanding of Winston Churchill, and I hope that reshaping will now last and last forever. Thank you. I don't know how we are for time. How are we for time? Five minutes, yes, right. I stand before you at lunch. <laughs> something that Churchill never allowed anybody to do. <coughs> yes, sir, at the back. You are obviously a real student of history and the reasons why different events have occurred in the past. And knowing that history does tend to repeat itself, even with different actors. Yes. How, what are your thoughts about the seriousness that the British are giving to removing the Holocaust from all their student books. So I didn't understand the last part of the question. I said, I, I'll repeat it. I said, what are your thoughts 
yeah. regarding the seriousness that the British are giving to removing the Holocaust from the educational books of history in their school system. I don't think it's true. <clears throat> I simply don't think it's true. <clears throat> no. Fake news. <laughs> As somebody temporarily famous would say. <laughs> right, any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, you know, the question was, why are Germans still continuously interested in Churchill? I love the confidence of your question. <laughs> but actually, there haven't been many books in German about Churchill at all. Kielinger, in fact, I think is the only one, and it's a very good book. And it's sold pretty well, I understand, in, in Germany. But uh, there's a gap. And of course, there are mixed reactions, particularly with older people in Germany about Churchill. He is seen more as the war leader, and as the war leader, he, of course, brought devastation to some extent on a large number of German cities, and that is still remembered. I think it's true that Churchill, when he was given the Peace Prize at Aachen, looked at the crowd which was cheering and clapping and waving and very enthusiastic and said to his own party, why are they reacting to me like that when I destroyed 50 of their cities? But, of course, we know the answer, because the devastation that Churchill wrought in war resolution and in defeat defiance ultimately saved Germany from itself. And the Germany that we have today would be inconceivable without the total victory that the Allies achieved, thank thanks in large part to Churchill's bravery in 1940, uh, it simply wouldn't exist. Yes, sir. Would an illustration of your point be the fact that when they met in Tehran, uh, Churchill uh, fell out with Roosevelt as Stalin over the murder of a German officer and sort of an execution style murder? Well, it's, it, it's a fascinating story, that, isn't it? And I, people, I think, know it, that uh, during the dinner, one of the dinners in Tehran, uh, Roosevelt's son, I think, basically, uh, got up and, and he could say very silly things, uh, advocated the mass execution of German officers uh, in the Wehrmacht after the war, and I think he named a figure of 50,000. And then it became a joke in very bad taste because uh, they were saying around the table, well, if not 50, uh, you know, what about 48,000? And Churchill suddenly got up and left the room because there was, and this is one of the extraordinary paradoxes for which uh, we must be so grateful in Churchill himself, that nobody fought the war more vigorously. Nobody was, in a sense, more ruthless in the prosecution of the war than he. But the fact is, he remained deep down committed to a concept of war which allowed for magnanimity in victory. And it was always there. He said when he went to Potsdam, you know, a few days he was there before being called back because of the British German elect general election. Uh, he toured the ruins of Berlin. And he said, looking at the ruins, my hatred of Germany died within me. The destruction, he, he had no interest ultimately, in the punishment of people after victory had been achieved. He wasn't in that game. And I think that explains, essentially, his reaction uh, at the dinner in Tehran. Churchill was, um, at every level, both by background and in terms of his basic instincts, he was, in the best sense, an aristocrat amongst men. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen.
We're going to have lunch served uh, in the petite salon right next door, buffet style, and we encourage you to bring your meal back in here, and shortly when it appears that most people uh, seem to be settled down, we are going to have two presentations, one from the National Churchill Museum and one from the Queen Mary. At, uh, the afternoon program will begin at 1.30.